Good evening and welcome. Tonight I'm going to be reading to you from this book about Poland. Now if you know my channel, you know that these books that I read are really interesting, but they are very old. So we're not going to read any of like the, the modern things, modern things, because this book is from 2002. So we're going to read the cultural section. So tonight we are going to read about Auschwitz and the Final Solution, Diverse Regions, Famous Filmmakers, Krakow, Lech Wałęsa, and Solidarity, Minorities of Poland, National Holidays, Our Lady of Czestochowa, Poets and Novelists, Polish Classical Music Composers, Pope John Paul II, Roman Catholicism, Scientific Legacies, Warsaw, and Water Pollution. This book's so old, Pope John Paul II was still alive when this book came out, so it refers to him in present tense, so that's how old this book is. So let's start off with the most depressing topic possible, and talk about Auschwitz and the Final Solution. Which, yes, it's devastating. Don't worry if this topic stresses you out, because it stresses me out. This doesn't go into any horrifying details. Um, but this is a very important part of Polish history, and this museum is, like, one of the most visited spots in Poland. It's, so, it's important to Polish history. Let's read about it. Hitler and the Jewish People In 1939, Poland was invaded by Nazi Germany. The Nazis believed that German people were special. Their leader, Adolf Hitler, called Germans the master race. He believed that the German people should rule the world and enslave everyone else. Hitler and the Nazis had particular plans for Jewish people. The Nazis wrongly considered Jewish people non-human and believed that the world's Jewish population should be killed or exterminated. This belief was called the final solution. Nazi key. In 1933, the Nazis built the first of many concentration camps, in which they imprisoned political opponents and used them as forced labor. Beginning in 1941, the Nazis built extermination camps. Most of these camps were in Poland, because it was the European country with the largest Jewish population. The Nazis killed millions of Jewish people at these extermination camps. The major extermination camps in German-occupied Poland were Treblinka, Chelmno, Sobibor, Belzec, Majdanek, and Auschwitz-Birkenau. Sorry, I was too busy worried about how to pronounce these names. I messed up. Anyway, Auschwitz. During World War II, the Polish city of Auschwitz was renamed Auschwitz by the Germans. In the suburbs of this town, the Germans built their largest concentration and extermination camp. At first, Auschwitz was a work camp, where Jews, Poles, Romani, and Soviet war prisoners worked as slaves, often to their death. Between 1942 and 1945, however, the Jews in the camp were systematically removed and were sent to their death in the nearby Auschwitz-Birkenau extermination camp. Jewish families from all over Europe were transported to this camp, and most were killed immediately in the gas chambers. Millions of Jewish men, women, and children were killed, and their bodies destroyed in crematoriums. Although the Nazis eventually tried to destroy Auschwitz and the evidence of their crimes, they were unable to dismantle the huge complex at the site. The camp is now a memorial to the people who died there, and elsewhere at the hands of the Nazis. Moving on to far more um, happier and calmer topics, let's talk about the diverse regions of Poland, starting with Great Poland. Located in the western part of central Poland, the region of Great Poland is the traditional birthplace of the Polish state. The Warta and Vistula rivers flow through the central part of this flat and mostly agricultural region on their way north to the Baltic Sea. Many ancient sites dating from the 10th century onward dot the countryside of Great Poland, 
and are part of the general historical record of the country's early history. A former capital city of Poland, Poznan is the largest city in Great Poland, as well as the capital of the whole region. With many new private industries starting up in Great Poland, the region is one of the fastest developing and most economically advanced in the country. Upper Silesia Upper Silesia lies in the southwestern part of Poland. Silesians speak a language that has Slavic and Germanic roots. This region has not always been a part of Poland, and some Silesians see themselves as a separate minority within Poland. A tiny minority even wish to create an independent Silesian country. Upper Silesia is a heavily industrialized region with thousands of factories and mines. Coal is mined in this area, but many mines are closing down because of the worldwide fall in demand for coal. Consequently, many Silesians are faced with the prospect of losing their jobs. Upper Silesia is one of the most densely populated areas of Poland. Katowice, the main city in the region, is where the composer Henryk Gorki lives. Other cities in Upper Silesia include Bytom, Opole, and Nysa. <laughs> no idea how to pronounce those. The Mazura Lakes region. The Mazura Lakes region in northeastern Poland is a sparsely populated region. Like Upper Silesia, this area has not always been part of Poland. Before World War II, this area was part of German East Prussia, and most German speakers were moved to Germany by the communist authorities after the war. Poland's two largest lakes, Schnarnka and Mamre, are situated in the Mazura Lakes region. Thousands of people visit the lakes to tour, camp, sail, and fish. Hunting is also popular there. Famous filmmakers. First we have Andrzej Wajda. One of the most famous Polish directors is Andrzej, um, I'm just gonna say Andrzej, Andrzej Wajda, who studied film in Łódź. Wajda is a distinguished film and theater director who was awarded the Golden Palm Award at Cannes Film Festival in 1981 and an Honorary Academy Award in 2000 for his contribution to the film industry. Wajda began his career with a trilogy of movies, The Generation, Canal, and Ashes and Diamonds. These movies showed the effects of World War II on the society that was created out of the ruins of that war. He went on to make movies that addressed important social issues in provocative ways. In Man of Marble and Man of Iron, Wajda showed the political changes in Poland that led to the creation of the Solidarity Movement. In 1982, he made Danton, a French movie about the French Revolution. His latest movie, his publication, is Pan Tadeusz, a retelling of the 19th century Polish literary masterpiece. Next is Andrzej Munk. An equally important figure of the 1950s in Polish film history was Andrzej Munk. His influential movies included Man on the Track and Eroika. He is not as well known worldwide as Andrzej Wajda because his life was cut short in a car accident. The Polish New Wave After Wajda and Munk, the next generation of Polish directors came to be known as the Polish New Wave. These filmmakers directed movies during the 1960s, and many documented the events of that period. Members of this filmmaking generation include Roman Polanski and Jerzy Skolomowski. Of these two directors, Polanski is the more well-known. He made his first and only movie in Poland, Knife in the Water, 1962. He moved to the United States in the late 1960s and directed movies such as Rosemary's Baby in Chinatown. He's also a trash person, and we do not like Roman Polanski on this channel. He should be in jail. Skol Skolomowski directed Identification marks none, and hands up. In the 1970s, another group of Polish filmmakers emerged as major artists. One of them was Agnieszka Holland. Holland's movies include Europa Europa and Olivier Olivier, both of which were highly acclaimed. 
She continues to make movies in Europe and in the United States. Next we have Krakow. The third largest city in Poland, Krakow was once the capital city of Poland. Krakow was different from other Polish cities because it was not destroyed by the Nazis during World War II. Visiting Krakow, therefore, with its beautiful buildings and monuments, is like visiting Poland as if it was before the war. The center of the city has been placed on the World Heritage List by the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, or UNESCO. This list gives the names of places that are of outstanding universal value to humankind. Krakow is a major center of commerce and culture in Poland. Many North American and Western European corporations choose to open up offices here. Polish arts and learning also continue to flourish in this ancient city. People from all over the world visit Krakow and enjoy its pleasant medieval atmosphere and historical sites. Countless concerts and plays are held in the city's many theaters and clubs. Wawel Castle The royal castle of Polish kings stands on the banks of the Vistula River on Wawel Hill. The castle served as the royal residence between the mid-11th and the early 17th centuries, and is a masterpiece of 15th and 16th century Polish architecture. The many rooms inside Wawel Castle were designed to show the power and wealth of Polish rulers. Much of the original decoration has survived intact, including elaborate wooden ceilings, marble fireplaces, colorful tapestries, and painted ceilings framed in gold. The castle is now a museum, and many thousands of visitors tour it each year. Churches of Krakow Wawel Cathedral, built in honor of St. Stanislaus, the patron saint of Poland, stands next to Wawel Castle. This cathedral was the site of the coronations of the kings of Poland. It is also the burial place of many famous Polish historical figures such as Tadeusz Kościuszko and Adam Mickiewicz. St. Mary's Church is also an important church and contains an altar made in 1489 by the German sculptor Weid Stoss one of the great artists of 16th century Europe. The Twin Towers of St. Mary's are famous landmarks in Krakow. Next we have Lech Wałęsa and Solidarity. Journey to Gdansk. Lech Wałęsa was born in 1943 in a small village not far from the Baltic Sea. After training at a state college, he left to seek work in Gdansk. There, he worked at the Lenin shipyards. In 1970, three years after arriving in Gdansk, Vyesha took part in his first strike against the communist government when the government planned to increase the price of food. He then became a labor organizer. He was fired from his job by the authorities because of his work to create a free, non-communist controlled labor union, a union designed to represent the interests of the working people in Poland. Birth of Solidarity. In 1980, Vyesha succeeded in creating a new national independent trade union and became the leader and spokesman for this organization. The name of this union was Solidarity. Vyesha was able to bring together different groups that wanted to change Poland's communist system of government. These groups included students, intellectuals, Catholics, and working people. But communists struck back in 1981. They imposed martial law and jailed Vyesa and many other members of the Union. He was released in 1982 and immediately resumed his work to bring democracy and freedom to Poland. In 1983, Vyesha was awarded the Nobel Prize for Peace for his work as the founder of the Solidarity Movement in Poland and for his work as a campaigner for human rights. Vyesha's determination and work finally brought peaceful change to Poland. In 1989, the communist authorities allowed limited free elections to be held. Pro-solidarity parties won all, won an overwhelming victory, with Tadeusz Mazowiecki becoming the new prime minister. Vyesha's dream had come true. Poland had become a democracy. 
soon communist countries all over Eastern and Central Europe, including the Soviet Union itself, followed Poland's lead, and communist governments were removed from power. Next are minorities of Poland, starting with the Kashubians, which you can see down here. The Kashubian people live in towns and villages near the Baltic Sea. They speak Kashubian, a language that is related to both Polish and German, but has evolved its own distinct rules. The sea is a major part of Kashubian life, and the history of these seafaring people has put them in contact with the nations that border the Baltic Sea. The Kashubian people have never had a country of their own. Throughout their history, they have been ruled by Teutonic Knights, Swedes, Germans, and now Poles. Kashubian culture was nearly lost in the early part of the 20th century, when modernization and industrialization lured many young people away from Kashubian villages. The language was not taught in schools, and the long tradition of Kashubian songs and dances was in danger of dying out. Efforts since 1945 to preserve and promote Kashubian culture have been successful, however, and their traditions and language have survived. Today, Kashubian songs and traditions are considered part of Poland's national heritage. While the Kashubian language is spoken in many Kashubian villages and traditional clothing is still worn. Polish Highlanders The Polish Highlanders, or Gorali, live in the high Tatra mountains of southern Poland. Isolated in mountain valleys and thick forests, the Gorali people have been able to preserve their traditions and language into the 21st century. The traditional architecture of the Gorali is visible in the foothills of the high Tatra mountains. High, steep, A-framed roofs made of wood characterize Highlander houses. Many homes are decorated with intricate wood carvings and painted in brilliant colors. Gorali artists are famous for their traditional wood carvings. Some artists make contemporary wooden furniture and other items. The most well-known artist is sculptor Jerzy Kenar. The colorful traditional clothes of Polish Highlanders are also works of art. Made from wool and decorated with colorful fringes, these clothes are worn during festivals and national holidays. And speaking of national holidays, let's read about some national holidays in Poland, starting with remembering the Constitution. Constitution Day, which honors the 1791 Constitution, is an important national holiday in Poland. On May 3rd, Poles in Poland and all over the world celebrate their heritage of tolerance and democratic principles. On that day in 1791, Poland passed its constitution, the first such charter in Europe, and only the second in the world after the U.S. Constitution. The Polish Constitution guaranteed the citizens of Poland rights and privileges that were unknown in the rest of Europe at the time. The Polish Constitution posed too much of a threat to the monarchs of Europe, who feared their own people would soon be demanding rights. <laughs> How horrible. By 1795, Poland had been invaded, partitioned, and ceased to exist as a state. The spirit of the Constitution did not die, however, as Polish people fought to regain independence. On November 11, 1918, Poland regained independence. The country lost independence once more in 1939, and then became independent once again in 1989. May 3rd is therefore an important and meaningful day for the Polish people. On May 3rd, all government agencies, schools, and businesses close in Poland. Ceremonies and speeches are held throughout the country. Most towns and cities hold parades. Some of the celebrations are official and are performed by the military and government officials. Most other Constitution Day celebrations are sponsored by community organizations and schools. And there's Independence Day. Independence Day in Poland is celebrated annually on November 11th. Military parades take place in Warsaw. The President of Poland addresses the country on television, and many Poles attend concerts and plays by orchestras and theater groups later in the evening. 
community organizations hold dinners that feature traditional singing, dancing, and poetry readings. And May Day. May Day on May 1st is a holiday that celebrates the important role played by working people. When Poland was a communist country, May Day was a major national holiday. The holiday is still celebrated, but it is no longer as important as it used to be. Next we have Our Lady of Czestochowa, which I'll let you look at this interesting painting, the Black Madonna. Let's learn about this history of this painting. This is so fascinating. With a population of about 250,000, Czestochowa is an industrial city located in the southern part of central Poland. The city is also one of the largest pilgrimage centers in the Christian world. Each year, more than one million people make the pilgrimage to the Yashnogora Monastery. Christians have been making pilgrimages to Czestochowa since the 14th century. The monastery contains the famous painting, Our Lady of Czestochowa, also known as the Black Madonna, which depicts Mary holding the infant Jesus. Ornamented in gold and jewels, the artwork is painted in a distinct Byzantine style. Soot from hundreds of years of candles lit in front of the painting has caused the work to become dark, which you can kind of see in, down here, a lot of <laughs> darkness. Looks very shadowy, but that's not intentional. History of a painting. The early history of the painting is not well known. Legend has it that Saint Luke painted the Black Madonna. The original painting, mounted on a wooden base, was most likely completed in the 9th century, somewhere in the Middle East. In 1382, Prince Vladislaw Opolsky took the painting from the castle of Bilge in Ruthenia which is now in present-day Ukraine, to save it from the attacking Tartars. During Opolsky's escape from Belge, a Tartar arrow struck the image. The damage done to the painting is still visible today. In 1384, Opolsky left the painting at Yashnogora Monastery. In 1430, thieves tried to steal the painting but failed. One of the thieves, however, slashed it twice with a sword. These slashes can also still be seen today on the right cheek of the Madonna's face. Check it out. Isn't that interesting? Wow. I don't know where the, um, the arrow hole is on there. You can't really tell from this picture, can you? These historical facts have added to the value of the painting, but it was in 1655 that the painting became an important symbol for Poles. In that year, Poland was almost conquered by Sweden's King Charles X. One of the last remaining defensible places in Poland was Yashnogora Monastery. After 40 days of fighting around the monastery, the Swedes began to lose ground and were eventually driven out of Poland. As a result of this event, Our Lady of Czestochowa became a symbol of Polish national unity. Really interesting. Let's read about some poets and novelists. The 19th and 20th centuries were a time of profound change for the people of Poland. Say that again. They regained independence in 1918, only to lose it again 21 years later, when Germans invaded Poland and committed some of the worst atrocities the world has ever seen. The country was invaded again at the end of World War II struggled for 44 years to free itself from communist rule. Perhaps because of this traumatic history, Polish literature has become recognized as providing the world with some of the most interesting and moving stories, poems, and novels. Starting with Joseph Conrad. Although he wrote all of his work in the English language and lived most of his life outside of Poland, Joseph Conrad was Polish. Born Józef Teodor Conrad Korzynowski, Conrad studied at a school in Krakow. He then decided to leave his troubled homeland for good and became a sailor. Conrad sailed all over the world on English merchant vessels. He rose through the ranks, learned English, and eventually became an English subject. He sailed the seas for more than 20 years. It was during those voyages that Conrad came up with his themes and stories. 
Most of his stories and novels take place on the sea. However, they are not adventure stories. Instead, they examine the experiences of people who are lost in the modern world. Important works by Joseph Conrad include Lord Jim and Heart of Darkness. I haven't read Lord Jim, but I had to read Heart of Darkness in school, and it doesn't really hold up. It's very depressing. Um, but if you've seen the film Apocalypse Now, it's a retelling of this book, and it, I think it gets the message across a lot better. Not as much racism in it. Famous Poets Poetry is a major art form in Poland. Students read poetry from elementary school onward, and poets have the same status of national heroes. Polish children learn to recite the works of such poets as Adam Mickiewicz, Juliusz Slowaki, Zygmunt Krzyzynski, and Cyprian Norwid. Polish actors study the art of poetry recitation as part of their training. In the 20th century, two Polish poets have received the Nobel Prize for Literature. Czeslaw Milosz and Wyslawa Szymborska in 1996. Let's read about some Polish classical music composers, starting with early music. Here we go. Early music written in Poland was religious in nature and written by composers employed by nobility. Early Polish composers were influenced by the styles and rules of music derived from their Italian, French, German, and English counterparts. Examples of this early type of music include the works of Mikolaj of Radom, Wojciech Dlugraj, and Grzegorz Gerzazzi Gorzyski. I tried, starting with Federic Chopin. Poland's most gifted classical music composer, Frédéric Chopin, was born in 1810 in a village just outside of Warsaw. His father was a French schoolmaster and his mother Polish. The young Chopin studied music in Warsaw and gave his first public concert at the age of eight. By the age of 15, he was composing music and soon gained an international reputation as a virtuoso piano player and composer. In 1831, Chopin went to France, where he became a successful teacher and performer in Paris. Chopin suffered from tuberculosis, and his frail health eventually kept him from performing. Nevertheless, his composing continued. His music was revolutionary for its time and still recognized for its melodic beauty and innovative use of harmonies. 19th and 20th century composers Henrik Wienowski is a famous 19th century composer. He was a virtuoso violinist. He did not write as much music as Chopin, but his works are often played in concert halls around the world. An annual violin competition in Poznan bears his name and shows his influence on classical music in Poland. The most popular Polish composer of the 20th century is Henryk Gorecki. Born in Upper Silesia, he teaches music at the State Higher School of Music in Katowice. His Symphony of Sorrowful Songs is one of the most often heard pieces of modern classical music. In 1993, a recording of the piece was even listed on the popular music charts of some countries in Europe. Gorecki sees his music as the product of his multicultural experiences in Upper Silesia, where Poles, Czechs, and Germans have had a long history of cultural interaction. And next we have Pope John Paul II. The Early Years Pope John Paul II was born Karol Wojtyla in 1920 in Wadwice, a town near the city of Krakow. He grew up and went to school in Wadwice. He then left Wadwice for Krakow, where he studied literature and philosophy. Along with his official studies, Karol, excuse me, <clears throat> Karol Wojtyla joined an underground theater group that put on secret performances during the Nazi occupation of Krakow. Wow, well, my... Uh, there we go. He avoided being deported from Krakow by working as a stonecutter. Wojtyla soon began to study theology and prepared himself to enter the priesthood. In 1946, he became a priest. A promising priest. Wojtyla studied it, or obtained... Wow, where did I get that? 
Wojtyla obtained a doctorate in theology and became a professor at the Catholic University of Lublin. He was eventually appointed to the chair of ethics at the Catholic University and became a bishop. He took an active role in the Second Vatican Council and that reformed the Roman Catholic Church in the 1960s. In 1964, Wojtyla became the Archbishop of Krakow. As Archbishop, he became an important figure in Poland's struggle against the Soviet-imposed system of communism. Why do they both look unamused with each other? <laughs> anyway, a Polish pope. In 1978, Wojtyla became the first non-Italian pope to lead the Catholic Church in 455 years. He took the name John Paul II. Over the years, his leadership has been controversial. In Western Europe and North America, he is often seen as being too conservative, especially with regard to his views on women and birth control. Pope John Paul II is the most traveled pope in history, having visited over 120 countries. For many, these trips have brought the religion down to a more human level. He has spoken out against dictatorships and made radical changes in the Roman Catholic Church such as establishing official contacts between the Vatican and the nation of Israel. He's the first pope to officially worship in a Jewish synagogue, as well as the first pope to enter a Muslim mosque. My throat, it just went like, no, no. <laughs> mm. Okay. <laughs> pope John Paul II has spoken about and apologized for the role of Catholics in the killing of Jews during World War II, and has also opened dialogue with the Eastern Orthodox Churches. I took an antacid before filming this, and the tiniest piece is just in my throat. I can feel it. I don't know where that popped out from, but there it is. Let's read more about Roman Catholicism in medieval times. Roman Catholicism has played a major role in the history of Poland. Poland became a Western European nation as a result of accepting Roman Catholicism in the year 966. The church also influenced Polish culture. Latin, for example, was the language of the educated classes in medieval times. Latin letters were used to represent the Polish language, to distinguish the language from other similar Slavic languages such as Russian, which used the Greek-based Cyrillic script. To the east of Poland, Eastern Orthodox Christians had converted the Slavic groups living there to Orthodox Christianity. This situation put Poland on the edge of the Roman Catholic world, as the country now neighbored non-Catholic states. Poland was thus seen as a guardian of Catholicism against the Orthodox form of Christianity. The Church in Modern Times After World War II, Poland became an overwhelmingly Catholic country since the Communists removed most non-Polish people from Poland. Many German speakers were sent to Germany, while many Ukrainians were moved to Ukraine, and many of the few remaining Jewish people left for Israel. When the Communists took over Poland in 1945, the Roman Catholic Church again played a major role in the life of the Polish nation. The Communists did not believe in religion, and Catholicism became a way for people to resist communism. The church was, therefore, unofficially involved in the political situation in Poland. Today, Poland remains a very conservative Catholic country, although not all Poles believe the Catholic Church should be involved in the political process. Many Poles believe the Catholic Church has too much power in Poland. In fact, the current Polish president, I'm sure he's not president now, Aleksander Kwasniewski, <laughs> I butchered that, whom the people of Poland re-elected for a second term in 2000 was not a candidate supported by the Catholic Church. He was a former communist. Moving on to scientific legacies, starting with Nicholas Copernicus. Nicholas Copernicus was born in Torun, Poland. He was an astronomer as well as a physician and economist. He studied the solar system and published the theory that Earth and the other planets in the solar system moved around the sun. As a young man, Copernicus studied at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow. In 1495, he decided to travel to Italy, where he studied law and medicine at the universities of Bologna and Padua. His interest in mathematics and astronomy grew. 
Using simple instruments, Copernicus made detailed astronomical observations. In 1503, he returned to Poland to practice medicine. Copernicus's interest in astronomy, however, remained strong. In 1543, he published On the Revolutions of the Celestial Spheres. Using mathematical analyses of the observations he made by himself and others, Copernicus proved in his book that his theory about planetary revolution in a sun-centered solar system was correct. Sun-centered solar system. At that time, people believed the entire universe revolved around Earth. At first, his theories were not understood, and it took hundreds of years for them to be accepted. Eventually, his ideas profoundly changed the way people studied the solar system. Maria Sklodowska Curie. Maria Sklodowska Curie won two Nobel Prizes, the first in 1903 for physics and the second in 1911 for chemistry. She and her husband, Pierre Curie, isolated the radioactive elements polonium and radium and discovered major properties of radioactivity. There's that dog again. Anyway. That is a barky, barky dog. Curie was born Maria Sklodowska, Sklodowska, Sklodowska in Warsaw. Although women in Russian-controlled Poland were not allowed to study at a university, she obtained an education in Warsaw, where she was an excellent student. In order to continue her studies, she moved to Paris, where she was the first woman to graduate with a degree in physics from the Sorbonne University in 1893. In Paris, Curie met and married Pierre Curie, also a scientist. Together, they built a lab to conduct their experiments and make their groundbreaking discoveries. I know that dog. It's a good dog. I'm not mad at it barking. That dog lives with like a little old lady, so that dog protects her. Next, let's read about Warsaw. I hope you don't mind the dog. It'll stop in a second. I probably just saw a raccoon. Warsaw is Poland's largest city and its capital city. Located in the center of Poland on the Vistula River, Warsaw has been destroyed and rebuilt many times. In 1655, the Swedes invaded Poland, captured Warsaw, and plundered and destroyed the city. The capital was slowly rebuilt under the rule of Poland's last king, Stanislaw Augustus Poniatowski. During World War II, the city was destroyed by the Nazis after the failed Warsaw Uprising of 1944. After World War II, Warsaw was rebuilt by the Communists, and the new town and old town were restored to their original medieval character. The rest of Warsaw's buildings, however, are influenced by Communist Soviet architecture. The Old Town. Let's see if I can squish this down. Warsaw's Old Town is a place many people enjoy visiting. Built in the 13th century, the Old Town is the perfect place to see buildings displaying different architectural styles, including Gothic and Romanesque, lining the cobbled streets. In summer, special cultural performances take place in Market Square. La Zienki Park Another spectacular place to visit in Warsaw is La Zienki Park. Once the grounds of the palace of the last king of Poland, the park is now a public space and a favorite place for people to visit for a stroll. The grounds include gardens, fountains, and tree-lined avenues. Unusual inhabitants of the park include peacocks that roam freely. In the park stands the palace on the water, an elegant 18th century palace fully restored to its original beauty. And cultural Warsaw. Warsaw is also the cultural capital of Poland. Among the many museums in the city are the Center for Contemporary Art, the Jewish Historical Institute and Museum, the Royal Castle Museum, and the Poster Museum, which displays the world-renowned traditions of Polish poster art. At the National Theatre, the best cultural troops from all around the world perform plays, operas, and ballets. The Warsaw Philharmonic Orchestra performs classical music. Many smaller theaters and venues offer all types of performances, including jazz, ballet, opera, and drama. And, ending on a bit of a depressing note, which hopefully is better now since this book came out uh, 20 years ago, <laughs> water pollution. Although Poland is a country of rivers, it still experiences shortages of drinking water. 
The cause of these shortages is not the lack of water resources, but the lack of water treatment facilities within the country. The communist regime that ruled Poland from 1945 to 1989 ignored all environmental concerns and built factories, industrial complexes, and residential developments without properly dealing with the issue of waste management. Consequently, much of the country's municipal and industrial waste was released untreated into the nation's rivers and lakes. As of late 1997, the water quality in almost half of the country's rivers was below acceptable levels. Most lakes in Poland are also highly polluted. Poland, like the other former Eastern Bloc countries, uses outdated technology to create energy, as well as to fuel automobiles and industries. This outdated technology often relies on the cheap coal found in the southwestern region of Upper Silesia, which is the most polluted region of Poland because of the coal industry. The rivers that have their sources in Upper Silesia are especially polluted, and it is these rivers that make their way to the Baltic Sea. Toxic substances found in Polish rivers and lakes include ammonia, nitrogen, phosphates and phosphorus, phenols, heavy metals, and potassium. Other toxic chemicals, such as sulfur and lead, enter the water through air pollution. The current government has taken many steps to solve these water pollution problems. The coal mines of the south are being closed down, while the industrial infrastructure left behind by the communists is slowly being dismantled. In their place, new, cleaner industries are being created. Water treatment and conservation is also a priority with the current government because of increasing local awareness, especially among young people, and pressure from Western European countries, Poland is beginning to reverse decades of environmental degradation. Yeah, this was even before they joined the EU, so surely the environmental standards have drastically increased since this. So, let's hope at least. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I do hope that you found this video relaxing and educational. And I hope that you have a very good Good, 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 good night.